Okay. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Sam from the Lincoln Public Library. I have the great pleasure to work there. Normally, you would be seeing our director, Catherine, sitting in this chair asking, asking questions of our visiting author, but, um, well, tonight you're stuck with me, so I'm so sorry. Um, I want to say a few words about our author, Paige Shelton, who's kind enough to give us some of her time. But first, I just want to say uh, the basic format for tonight is I'm going to have a chat with Paige. Um, at the end, I'm hoping folks will have some questions. There's a Q&A function at the bottom. By all means, type in your question there, and then I can ask Paige on your behalf or raise your hand. We might be able to do uh, some voice ones if anyone's calling in. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about tonight's thing is if you're interested in, in finding some of Paige's books, we have quite a few at the library, I'm happy to say, but also uh, we partnered like we did last time with Facing the Book, which is a great little independent bookstore who has some of her books. Uh, their website is just getyourfaceinabook.com and they have a couple of her books. If you scroll down, they, they have them there. Um, and so please do not hesitate to run out and buy every single page Shelton book you can after tonight <laughs> or check it off in your local library. Um, but yes, yeah, so our, our author, Paige Shelton, had a nomadic childhood as her father's job as a football coach took her family to seven different towns before she was even 12 years old. After college at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, she moved to Salt Lake City. She thought she'd stay only a couple years, but instead she fell in love with the mountains and a great guy who became her husband. After many decades in Utah, she and her family moved to Arizona. And through everything, she's wanted to be a writer since she was seven years old. She writes the Alaska Mystery Series, which starts with Thin Ice, as well as the Scottish Bookshop Mystery Series, which begins with The Crack Spine. Her other series, which are all mysteries, include Farmer's Market, The Country Cooking School, and A Dangerous Type Mystery Series, which I believe has the incredible title of To Helvetica and Back, the first one. Yes, correct. <laughs> that is a great title. <laughs> Well, welcome, Paige. How are you tonight? I am great. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Catherine, for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. I appreciate everything you guys do for the community. It's wonderful to be here. Hi, everybody. Wonderful. All right. So the first question I wanted to ask you was, um, so you wanted to be a, a writer since you were little. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what it was that put that passion to you at such an early age? And kind of what was your road to becoming an author? Sure, you bet. I was seven and I wrote a poem. It was a very short poem. It was about a kite. I still remember it. Fly, fly through the air. That kite will never give me a care. One day I went to fly my kite and my kite flew out of sight and I was hooked. The written word became, and I even still have the little, it was in a little um, multicolored notebook that had like a psychedelic print, you know, from the 60s and 70s, you know, the psychedelic prints on the outside. I still have that. And I still have have the handwritten poem, which also on the outside of the notebook, I put the fun stickers, which were of candy cigarettes. So that's how long ago it was, because we don't talk candy cigarettes anymore. But um, so I had all of that. And I was hooked from age seven. But between seven and so I was seven in about 1971, giving my age away, but um, from about that time until about 1997, I got, you know, mixed up in other things, school, life, work, uh, getting married, um, having a kid, you know, growing up and having jobs and paying the bills. But then in 1997, I thought, I am going to take this seriously. I'm going to do this. I know I'll be published by 2000 because, you know, Y2K, we were going to lose all our water. We were not going to have any electricity. So I thought I better get my books out before then. So for sure, I know I'll be published. Well, Y2K passed and I hadn't had a bite on anything, but I continued on. I got a ton of rejection, um, some nice, some not so nice. Uh, then by 2008, things started to come together. I, I quit writing or trying to write romance and I focused more on mysteries. And that's really what I'd read mysteries more than romance over the years. And so it wasn't easier. It just made more sense in my brain when I started writing mysteries. And in 2008, I found my wonderful agent, Jessica Faust, and she was from bookends and she was terrific. And the book I gave her to sell didn't sell. So here I was thinking, oh no, I'm, I had one of the greatest agents on the planet and I'm still not going to be a writer. 
But she called me and we brainstormed and we talked about different ideas. And she said, what about something farmer's market? And it dinged. And I'm like, ah, oh, that sounds good. Let me work on that. So I put something together for her, sent it to her. And within two days, it was sold. And my first book published in 2010. So it was 13 years after that 1997 goal of uh, getting published. But you know, you just have to stick with it long enough. If you're, if you're crazy enough not to give up, you'll, you'll get there eventually. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good way to put it. (laughs) Up until more recently, you've written mostly what is described as cozy mysteries. Mm-hmm. How would you describe what a cozy is to someone who's not familiar with the term? Sure. A cozy mystery has a, a number of different elements. Obviously, there's still murder mysteries. So there are still dead people involved. However, the murders and anything brutal or anything graphic is off the page and really not mentioned. Along with cozy mysteries, you have you usually have an amateur sleuth. So it's not someone who is in law enforcement necessarily. For instance, with the farmer's market, the first of my series, um, my protagonist who solves the mysteries actually has a stall at the farmer's market. So uh, you always have a, um, a hook and like a farmer's market hook or a cooking school hook, Scottish bookshop, those sorts of things. Uh, and, and they're very clean. They're clean mysteries. They have clean language. They have, again, no graphic. Um, and uh, a lot of them have pets, cute pets, like dogs and cats as well. You'll see a lot of cats and dogs on the covers. You know, when I first started, when uh, Jessica, uh, my agent told me that I had a voice for cozies, I, I wrote it down C on, on a piece of paper. C-O-S-Y or C-O-Z-Y question mark because she said I had a good voice for a cozy and my first response was oh my gosh I love cozies we hung off hung up the phone and I I ran to Barnes and Noble and I said I don't even know what a cozy is because somebody (laughs) helped me understand what a cozy is I mean I was faking it till I could hopefully make it Um, but uh, fortunately the the bookseller at that particular store was kind enough to show me and I had been reading cozies before Agatha Christie is sometimes considered cozy, sometimes traditional and cozy. Um, but the cat who books, uh, those are those are kind of cozy. Elizabeth Peters, Egypt, Egyptian books, those sorts of things. So I had been reading cozies all along. I just didn't know what they were. So like, like Murder, She Wrote. Yeah, right. Exactly. Murder, She Wrote. Right, right. One of our patrons quotes uh, the author Katrina McPherson uh, as, as always saying, uh, somebody ends up dead, but nobody gets hurt. Yeah, <laughs> Very good. Very good. I love that. <laughs> uh, but your newer series, the, the, the Alaska Mystery Series, uh, you've moved away from the cozies into more into suspense. What inspired that change? Well, you know, writers write and you get inspiration and you you have these files. I mean, I have files with uh, suspense, with thrillers, with other cozies, with even with now with some romance and women's fiction. And you you kind of in between books, you you pull something out to make your mind work a little bit differently. And then sometimes things come together. A lot of times they don't come together. Um, uh, this Alaska thing kind of came together and I sent it to Jessica again. And, you know, we had to manipulate it a little bit, but we both liked it enough that we stuck with it and uh, turned it basically into, you know, a a new series. And it is definitely not cozy. Um, It's definitely more toward the suspense side of things, a little, little edgier. I just wanted to share the, um, the, the cover for, for the books, because you and I were talking before we, we started this, uh, this call. And I just think these covers are incredible. You mentioned a great detail about the designer. Um, I was wondering if you could share that with everybody. Sure. The designer, I love the covers too. I think they've done an extraordinary job. Minotaur is the publisher. But the designer who did these covers actually created the font. So you see the thin ice and the cold wind. And then um, even for the third book, that's a little different in color scheme, but uh but he created the font himself. So it's very cool. I love it. And I just want to share. Thank you. You're very welcome. I, I you know, uh, I know I shouldn't say uh, since I work in a library that you, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but let's be <laughs> cool. a really cool cover catches your eye. They are cool covers, aren't they? They're yeah. great. They're great. Yeah. So this is the one, the third book is, comes out later this year. 
December of this year. Yes. Yes. And it's turned in and it's done and it's ready to roll. Oh, wonderful. So my next question was, uh, So, Alaska, you also have a, a personal detail uh, from having spent some time traveling through Alaska. Because my question was initially was going to be, before I did my research on you, uh, do you get to travel when you think, oh, Alaska or something like that? Do you think, oh, I'm going to go travel and, and something I can write off on my taxes later? Or, or how did Alaska especially speak to you? Well, I'll, I'll, I will tell you about Alaska in a second, but that is absolutely the initial inspiration for the Scottish bookshop series. I thought, okay, I want to write a bookshop series. Where should we put it? Well, let's put it in Scotland. So we have to go to Scotland (laughs) if we can write off a trip to Scotland. So actually it, it was kind of the inspiration for that trip. Alaska, my ties to Alaska are a little different. Um, my in-laws lived there and my husband and I actually went up there for our honeymoon um, after we were, after we were married down in Logan, Utah, so we were lived in the Salt Lake area and we were married in Logan, but we went up to Alaska for our honeymoon and just kind of drove around Alaska and went fishing in Homer um, uh, did all, you know, all the Alaska things you're supposed to do went to Denali. It was actually a clear day. We saw the mountains. So that was really fun. And that that's a rare moment. Um, uh, we saw killer whales in, I think it was cook inlet, which is unheard of. And you weren't, so everybody, nobody believed us until they looked at the news that night. And it was the lead story on the news. We were vindicated, but it was, it, it was, it was really fun. And then in going in writing a series about Alaska, I wanted to do something in a little different area. So we actually went up to Gustavus, which is the Glacier Bay National Park area, which is down farther down in Alaska, closer to Canada. And uh, we did that three years ago. And so we went into Juneau and then we took a ferry into Gustavus and that was fabulous. And Juneau, I mean, that, that place is incredible. It's built on a, it's kind of a tourist place and you see the ships go through, but it's built right, right on a a mountainside on the ocean. It is so incredible. And I, I sense ghosts and it was one of the most haunted places I have ever been around. It was, it was full of all kinds of ghostly sensations. My husband didn't feel any of it, but I felt all of them. They were all around and that was fabulous. And then over in Gustavus, which is what I have based Benedict upon. Um, it was just, the people were incredible and it, it is very primitive, primitive. The, uh, what I put in the Alaska books about the internet only being accessible at the library and the airport is the truth. That is Gustavus. Yeah, that's right. And so really, truly, when the library closes at noon uh, for some time, people go over to the airport so they have Internet access. So I know it's fabulous. It's a fabulous place. I would I would highly recommend everybody go. Yeah. And I think I've heard you say before, like you need to be of a slightly tougher metal to to make it in Alaska. Oh, absolutely. You have to 100 percent be made of strong stuff. I mean, I know I. I know I would struggle through a winter. I'd probably be okay, but boy, I tell you what, you've got to be made of strong stuff, even in the nicer um, climate areas where it, I mean, even around Gustavus, sometimes it's nice enough that the bears don't hibernate during the winter. (laughs) And that's a whole other set of of circumstances, but um, boy, you have to be made of strong stuff. It's primitive that there, that place will swallow you whole. The the state, you can turn a corner and be gone forever. It, it It's very, very primitive and vast. Yeah. It sounds like a great place to, it is. to run away to, which is partially the plot of, of the Alaska Mysteries. And, and find right, run away and hide. Yep, that's exactly, yep. Um, exactly. Now, are you more of a plotter or a pantser? And have you ever written yourself into a hole that you couldn't get out of? Well, I haven't done the written myself into a hole yet. And I am much more of a pantster, pantser, pantster. Um, I'm trying very hard to be a plotter. I do a plot group with two of my lovely friends and wonderful authors, Kate Carlisle and Jen McKinley. And we actually get together and try to work on plots together. And um, I think that every, you know, I love them dearly and they're very kind to me, but sometimes they look at me like, oh, she's, she's hopeless. <laughs> but um, but I, I, I've done most of my stuff by the seat of my pants. And what that really means is for me, I think it's an extra version 
of, of the work. It takes me about 200 pages to really find the story. So a lot of people who can, who's, who can really actually visualize a full story probably can do the plotting much better, but I need the 200 pages to actually get the role, get, you know, get the feel for the story and figure out where I'm going to go. Hmm. So how has your writing process evolved over the years? And, and, you know, does that 200 pages kind of survive mostly intact to the final cut? Yes, the 200 pages has survived. What has evolved oddly and very, very strangely, I used to write with a word count in mind every day with a certain amount of words that I needed to reach every day. And somewhere along the way, I switched to just writing a certain amount of pages every day. And for a reason I will never be able to understand, except that maybe when you see that little number at the bottom of your screen and you watch it and you've only gone up three numbers in the last hour, you know, that's frustrating. But when I switch to pages, things actually seem to be smoother. I couldn't really tell you why, but yeah, that's, that's about the only evolution. I've always had to kind of write when I could fit it in. I love to write first thing in the morning. That's my favorite, favorite time to write. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, my, I have an elderly mother. Sometimes that doesn't always work out that way, but uh, I have other things I have to do, but I love writing first thing in the morning and that's always been the same. Okay. Uh, So my other question is is when you start your series and I could see where this would be a little trickier with a, with a more suspenseful character driven series. When you start book one, how much do you know set let's say about like book two or book three or or where the characters lives are going to go as it progresses well for me when i've um turned in a series to my agent for her to sell um part of that is a synopsis of perhaps the second and third book so that's always been part of it but i can tell you with 100 percent certainty that 100 percent of the time those second and third book synopsises have changed by the time i finished the first book excellent yeah now is there it's having written several ongoing series what are the advantages and are there any drawbacks to having multiple series or a recurring set of characters to revisit well, I think that I, you, you get to love the characters and you miss them when you're not hanging with them a little bit. And so you can go back and revisit what they're doing and see what's happening. And they're very comfortable and you learn their ways and you learn how they're going to approach things. Um, and the series, when you write a series, it gives people also more of a chance to find your books, um, you know, uh, and, and, choose whether they're going to like those characters or not. And then as a series, they're going to climb aboard and stay for other books. Or, you know, if they're, if the characters in the story don't do it for them, they won't, but it gives you more of a chance to keep, keep your readers in a certain flow. As far as the drawbacks go, you kind of sometimes run out of ways to kill people. (laughs) So you have to, you have to remember, oh, wait, I just stabbed the person in the last book. I can't stab somebody in this book. So you have to be creative about your methods of murder. Um, And, and you have to, when you're creating relationships, I think it would be very difficult for me to write um, an amateur detective or a detective of any sort with kids. So if my, if my characters are having relationships and getting married, et cetera, I have to find a way not to bring kids into it. But uh, the benefits definitely outweigh the, the disadvantages. Wonderful. Do you ever find yourself doing like an Agatha Christie thing where you're you're going to dinner parties, like trolling for like, what's the news poison that, you know, is odorless or colorless or tasteless? Oh, all the time, all the time, all the time. I'll turn to my husband. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is brilliant. I mean, I, I, we watch the 48 hours and the datelines and all those things on TV, the true crime stuff. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is absolutely brilliant. I'm going to have to use that. And in fact, um, for Thin Ice, I don't want to give anything away, but in fact, I did use a method of murder um, I heard about on 48 Hours. So that was kind of fun. Nice. Yeah. I was going to say, what's... Or no, a method of investigation. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to interrupt. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's the weirdest thing you've had to research for one of your books? Ah. <sighs> Good question. The weirdest thing. Well, I did, I did research a bunch of poisons and then I, 
even bought a book on poison and uh, po poisonous plants and everything. And, and so I get the book and I'm like, gosh, I hope nobody around me dies of a poison. Maybe I better wipe off all my fingerprints on this book. So nobody suspects I've been reading it, but, um, and, and also uh, what I had to research not too long ago for cold wind was what would happen to a dead body that's been frozen in the Alaskan um, uh, winters for seven years. So that, and, and, and what would it look like? What colors you, and, and that sort of thing. And so that was kind of weird. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have another, some gruesome pictures. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so how did you celebrate when you first found out you'd be published? And also how did it feel the first time you walked into like a bookstore or library and saw, you know, your name on one of those books? Well, the, the first time I heard I was going to be published, believe it or not, um, my husband and my son, my son was probably 11 at the time, we were leaving Disneyland, we were in the rental car to go back to the airport to go home. So we had just left the most magical place on earth. So, to, you know, and, and I got a call from Jessica saying she has sold the farmer's market. So it was bizarre to have that all mixed in, first of all, and of course, extremely exciting. I mean, 13 years, if, and if you go back to when I was age seven, a million years, you know, <laughs> working toward this one goal and it was, it was spectacular. And seeing, seeing my books in the libraries, in the, in the bookstores, well, it never gets old. Never, ever does it get old. It's always a thrill. And, and not only that, it's always like, is that really me? Did I do that? Hey, look at me. Look, that's me. I did that. <laughs> so it's always wonderful. Never will get old. Good. And just a reminder again, we have several pages books at the library right now. Uh, we're not open Thank at the moment, obviously, but for you to go rush out and check out. Um, and I, I'm always curious, as an author, how much of your time is spent uh, with the non-writing parts, like the more the business, the communication with the agent, doing events like this? Mm -hmm. How much of that part that I don't think people think about when they're writing their book, you know, consumes your day? Sure. It can, it can be very little. Um, it can be just a couple hours a week, or it can take a couple weeks to get things prepared and, and in order uh, to get things written for, for perhaps different blogs or, or get things uh, situated and on the calendar. It can take a couple weeks chunk at a time. Um, but you know, you have a lot of lulls in between. Um, a lot of the time when you're not having a new book come out soon or something like that, you're just kind of in the writing mode and, and you're not doing any extra marketing. Um, I, I enjoy Facebook. I enjoy Instagram. So for me, I try to make that a daily thing, but that's, that's not taxing. And, and that's just become kind of part of every day. Okay. Yeah. I also kind of curious, you mentioned the, the timeline there. How long does it take you to usually write a book and then by that point, like what's the timeline before it, it's in people's hands? Sure. Um, I usually get it turned in about a year before it publish, publishes. And, and here's where the weird part that I was talking about. The, um, when I switched from word count to page count, when I was doing a word count, it would take me six months to write a book. When I switched to doing a certain number of pages every day, it now takes me about four months to write a book. I know. So I still don't understand why, but, but yeah, it takes me about four months. You know, part of that could also be, I've written now 22, 23 books that I've turned in and perhaps it just gets a little faster as you go, but I, I still tie it in with the switch to the page count. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what is the first book that you remember reading and loving? Or is there any book that you're like, I wish I wrote that? Oh, Jurassic Park, I wish I wrote, number one. I know that's weird, but yeah, I wish I wrote Jurassic Park. Um, Little House on the Prairie, of course. That is, a, that is a very typical, or Little House in the Big Woods. That is a, a very typical answer. I doubt you'll find many people my age who, who you know, Laura Ingalls Wilder wasn't such a huge um, thing in their lives, but uh, Little Women at the time. Um, I've read Little Women as a grown up and it didn't quite strike the same chords it did for me when I was 11. Uh, and then of course the Nancy Drew books, of course the Nancy Drew. Oh my gosh, Nancy, Ned, all those people loved them, loved them. They're still real in my head. Definitely. But the author who I probably 
loved grow, you know, as I got a little older, you know, through middle age years and through the adult years as Phyllis A. Whitney, she was, she, she captivated me. Her writing captivated me forever. Um, she was, I thought she was fabulous. And, and then others, of course, as I've gotten older, you know, Sue Grafton, oh my gosh, my hero, <laughs> but there are a lot. Yeah. I kind of appreciate that they didn't do the move where they had someone take over the alphabet. Me too. The alphabet will end at Y, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how has, because I know you've mentioned you're, you're, you're very interactive with your fans on social media. How has that changed over the years? And, and, and has that led to anything different in the, the writing side of it? I don't think it's led to anything different. Um, I, I, I think I got right in on the beginning of everything. So people who were reading my books could find me very quickly. And I feel like I've made some really terrific friends that I've never met in person. And, and that's an incredible thing. I think about how, how people I've never met in person have given me such happiness over these last years via Facebook of all things. Um, and I would, I would just hate to not have them in my life. I, I'm very appreciative of them very much. And the other question I have is, has anything changed just with, you know, like a global pandemic? I mean, obviously a lot less travel, but has anything else like affected just the writing in that way? Or, or, or what is that like writing during a pandemic? Yeah, it really hasn't changed much for me because I've worked from home for so long um, that that didn't change much. Uh I, you know, I still right now go to the grocery store with my mask on and all that kind of stuff. But, but as far as my writing goes, it, it was really almost not even noticeable in, in, in that nothing changed there. Been, if I were a coffee shop writer or something like that, that probably would have affected it, but I wish I could write in a coffee shop, but it's always just my little office in the back of my house. And so um, it really didn't change much of anything. Okay. I'm fascinated by the people who, I don't know, crave that needing to be out, needing that noise. I just, I feel like you're just asking to get distracted. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it works for some, I guess. I mean, it, it, maybe it's like having, you know, something in your ear and you turn something else on. So you don't have to hear the ringing in your ear or something, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I couldn't do it. I've tried. I just stare at people or try to overhear conversations. You know, I'm just so curious about what's happening in everybody's lives that um, I don't do well in public. <laughs> collecting details yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so really the, the the last question i had for you was just what are you working on at the moment and what's next for you okay i am working on um the okay so deadly editions publishes in april that is the sixth scottish bookshop and so that will be out in april and then uh the next one which i am still kind of working on is called Burn, oh, I hope I can tell you this. The, I think I can. I think it's. I think it's okay. The burning page or the burning pages. Now I can't. But anyway, so that one. That one. I'm working on that. Um, I finished up the Alaska three. So I'm kind of in a holding pattern to start yet another Scottish. But I don't have even. Well, I have a teeny tiny bit of an idea for that one, but. Um, it's about the, uh, it centers in the Scottish bookshop books. I always do some Scottish history or some local Scottish lore. And so I'm trying to figure out the, the history or lore I'm going to do in the next book. Okay. Wonderful. I just wanted to share the cover to deadly editions of everyone. Um, there it is. Thank you. It's, it's just got such a, a, a warm and literally cozy, like feeling to the cover. Um, they're great covers. They really do a great job. Yeah. And what is that process like too? I'm always curious. I've always wanted to just grab an author and ask them, what is that process like? Just, you know, like, you know, one or one designer is creating a whole new font for you, but like, just, is there a lot of drafts? Are you looking at a lot of, are you rejecting a lot of covers? Well, I, you know, um, as an author, you don't get to reject a lot of covers. Okay. <laughs> so so uh, I've been very lucky in that my editor and um, my editors at both publishing houses, some of my early series are at a different publish 
publishing house. They've they've listened very much to what I've said and my input, et cetera. And um, in fact, if you look at the Scottish bookshop books, starting with The Stolen Letter, the book that published last year, there was a switch, a change in the covers. And that was based upon a really lovely conversation I was able to have with my editor about we need to have, you know, we need to have a little bit of a different feel. Sometimes you don't, when you start a series, you don't know where the feel of the series is going to go. So um, with that change, I think they brought the feel, even though they were all cozy, it feel a little better. Um, I, I do get to see a draft and I do get to say whether I like it or not and have some input. Uh, but I, there's not, you know, there's not a ton. The designers, the designers do a good job. So they listen, but but they know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> it just got to be so, so exciting. Like it's, it's Christmas for you multiple times a year. You get the email with new, new covers for this thing that you wrote coming to life. It is absolutely the most exciting part. It is so wonderful. You see the email and the subject, you see the, you know, jacket art for, for what book and you, you know, you anticipate and you have to open it slowly and be, it, it is always exciting. It's wonderful. It brings it to life. It's like having a new kid. Yeah. <laughs> said, I'm always, I'm always fascinated by the process. So I always just want to ask about that stuff. Like for audiobooks, mm -hmm. how involved do you get to be on like the reader, the narrator? Oh, um, I got for, I think for both, I think for any of my audio books, I've been sent samples, like two or three samples. And I've been able to give my input on who I thought sounded more like the person in my head. So that was really lucky. I feel fortunate to have been able to do that. And I think they do a brilliant job, by the way. I don't know how they do what they do. It's incredible, particularly the ones with the accents and, and switching things up that way. But um, uh, like, for instance, today, I just got four deadly editions. I just got a copy of the artwork that will go around the um, the cassette, the uh, cassettes, the DVD or CDs. Mm. Oh, I'll get there. The CDs, as well as the art that'll be for the ebook. And uh, they, they asked if I liked it. And then they had some copy that we wanted to change. So they let me change some copy and the art was great. So no worries. So yeah, they, they do send it to you. Wonderful. That's gotta be so much fun. And, yes. and like I said, I enjoyed the, the crack spine and uh, the narrator is great. Especially Thank going into the, the Scottish accent and I would she pause it and then try to like imitate it myself to work on my own Scottish accent, which was. Oh, good. <laughs> they do much better than I do. Um, oh, I hear you. <laughs> uh, um, so I want to open it up to anyone watching. If you have any questions for Paige, uh, there's a Q and A function um, at the bottom of the, the zoom window. Or we could probably do, if you want to raise your hand, I should be able to, to unmute you and, and perhaps uh, get some, some questions that you can ask. But we have one from Sue, who says, hi, Paige, it's Sue Super. Will I ever learn if Creighton is a good cop or not <laughs> for writing incredible stories and creating such wonderful characters? Hi, Sue. Sue is one of the people I was talking about earlier, a Facebook friend who I've never met in person who I can't imagine not having in my life. She's absolutely fabulous. So thank you, Sue, first of all, for, for writing that. Um, uh, Creighton is a character in my Dangerous Type series, of which there were three. And uh, the third book ended with kind of a, a cliffhanger suspicion about Ooh, is he a good guy or is he a bad guy? And then the publisher did not purchase any more books. So as of this moment, Sue, I'm sorry. I don't think we're going to find out. But as, as you know, you never say never. You just never know what's going to happen tomorrow. But as of today, there are no new plans. And thank you again, Sue. Love hearing from you. Yes, that was a, was a super question. I just want to share because I love... I love the title of, of this book. I love the title of that of that whole series, but uh, comics they're, like they're, murder. <laughs> yeah, they're great titles. They were fun. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. So does anyone want to raise their hand or or type in a question in our Q and A box for for Paige? I'm an open book. Ha ha. <laughs> All right. Looks like we've got Rita here. 
And Rita, if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask a question. Um, Paige, this is for you. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, and the title is In Cold Blurb. And the subject is, and for you too, Sam, is it time to kill the book blurb? And um, the next statement says, endorsements for new books from established writers are roach, insincere, and most impossible to get rid of. They create so much work, emotional labor, and guilt, whether one is writing one or one is asking for one. And, you know, I will admit, make culpa, that I do look at the book of the back, back of a book and see who has written a blurb. And yet this article fascinated me. Um, so what's your opinion on that? Do you have to seek blurb writers or how does it go? Oh, that is a fabulous question, and I had not I had not seen that article. So, from a different per, from a couple different perspectives. First of all, asking for blurbs is tough. It's a, it's always a very nerve wracking. Oh, should I? Shouldn't I? That sort of thing. So that is always tough, no matter what. But writing the blurbs is is not as difficult as you might think. And I, and it's a little bit of when my first book was published, Farm Fresh Murder, and the fabulous author, Sheila Connolly, I, I mean, she recently passed, rest in peace, Sheila, but she wrote a blurb for my farmer's market book. And I was over the moon. I was absolutely over the moon that she did that. And it was, it was such a source of pride for me to see that on the cover that any blurb that I'm ever asked to write is not, is not difficult for me to take on at all. So it's difficult for me to ask, but ask away to me. I'm happy to do any because I remember that moment when Sheila put the blurb and I like reading them too. I love seeing that, um, you know, Jim McKinley or Kate Carlisle actually blurbed this, this cozy mystery series and I'm all over it, you know, no question. So I, I, I still like them. I'm, I'm all for them. Ah, there we go. And that is actually Claudia's blurb on the front of that one. And Claudia was fabulous too. I don't know where Sheila is, but I remember Sheila was the first one, very, very first one. And I will appreciate that forever. Well, thank you. And uh, Sam, I'll just, I'll just mention, this is the Wall Street Journal, February 27 and 28. And uh, the review section and, and uh, I don't know, no, no page on it, but it just fascinated me. Uh, I'll drop the, the old fashioned print copy uh, in the mail uh, to you just so you can um, read it. But, but again, thank you so much because thank it just fascinated me. And, oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for this interview. How wonderful. Oh, well, I'm having a great time. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Rita. Um... See, do I know how to? There we go. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or want to raise their hand? I think I saw one before. Um, just to follow up to that, have you ever gotten one where you're like, ooh, I don't know what to say about this book? I have not received one that way. And I would tell you, I really would. I wouldn't tell you the title, but <laughs> I have not received one. All the books I've been asked to blurb have just been absolutely delightful. And I'm not kidding. It, it's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any authors while we see if there's any more hands that you just, you're just dying to see when they have a new book out that like who, who, who always ends up on your nightstand to read? Hmm. Well, the newest one is Riley Sagar. Am I, am I saying his name correctly? As Sager, Sagar? I don't know. Like but he's my newest. Um, I read, oh, I'm so bad at titles. I'm even bad at my own titles, but I read one of his books and then I had to read them all. I just really like his tone, his voice, uh, really terrific. Um, and let's see, uh, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to need some help with the title, but the, something about the leaves, uh, Ginny or Glinny Vander something or other. Anyway, uh, I, I wish I could remember it. I apologize. But she's got a new book coming out. And the first book of hers, Glinny? Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I should know this. But I'll, I'll, I'll try to figure it out as, uh, as I'm thinking it'll come to me. But um, that was terrific. Uh, other than that, I just I love to try new authors. I love a debut. I love a debut. Mm. Excellent. Uh, like I said, any other, anyone else want to raise their hand or, or put, we got a question in the chat here. Anybody remembers that book? Speak up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a comment from Missy who just wanted to say hi to Paige from Iowa and, and also say 
go Bulldogs. I know. Hi, Missy. And again, here's Missy, another Facebook friend who I've never met in person who I just can't imagine my life without. Thank you, Missy. And the Bulldogs, my alma mater, the Drake Bulldogs just won their uh, basketball game right before our interview tonight. So now they'll be, they had to, it was a play in game to get into the, um, the March Madness. So I'm so excited. It was really exciting. I love it. <laughs> Excellent. And we have a great question from Jerry. Uh, how do you work if you're editor and have you ever disagreed? With your um, I've had three editors and they are possibly some of the smartest young women I have ever been around or gotten to know in my life. And they have been so insightful. Um, I had one little tiny disagreement on my first Scottish and my, my absolutely fabulous editor said, okay, we can do that. It was no big deal or anything like that. But because my editors have been so smart, I trust them completely. Okay. Totally. Yeah. And, and what is kind of the, the hierarchy? Like who, when you finish a, a book, do you have like a, like a, like a, you have a beta group, but like who, who sees it first? Does it go to your agent? Does it go to an editor? When I finish a book, I send it directly to my editor and then my editor will send it back with revisions. And so um, I have a certain amount of time to do the revisions and that can be anything from uh, cleaning up scenes to, re, you know, switching scenes to changing the ending to changing the beginning. Revisions can be anything on the, on the entire spectrum. So I turn it back into the editor and they decide if that's good for where it is, or perhaps they want more revisions. If they don't want any more revisions, they send it to a copy editor hmm. and the copy editor will go through and edit the copy. And that's where, you know, punctuation and grammar and, and they find the ones like, for instance, the word wave was in a paragraph two, three, four, five times. I can't remember why, but but the copy editor would put on the side, oh, look, they're multiplying. So that's kind of what a copy editor does, try to save you from those sorts of things. And then you get it back and you accept those or you reject those. I've really never rejected any. Again, they know what they're doing. So mm -hmm. then you turn it back in and then it goes for one more edit and you get the teeniest, tiniest corrections of like if your period's missing or quotes or something like that, you get to fix it that way. And then you turn it back in and then it's gone. And then it takes still about a year before it comes, it's published, but it's back and forth a few times. And I'm always curious about this and I, I only kind of know. So I figure I'll ask you in case anyone else is curious, what happens exactly during that year? I've always been fascinated by just what is the Hold on. Is it marketing? Is it legal? You know, I don't think it's legal, but that's a really good question. And I'm not sure I know the answer exactly to it. I'll give you what I think is happening. I think they're getting the book typeset. I think the marketing people are thinking about the marketing plans and working on, on designs like that. But when you're writing, when you're writing a book and a year is to pass, you would be shocked at how fast that goes. It's like I've always said, you know, time flies. If you want it to fly, fly faster, get writing deadlines. It'll just zip right on by. So um, I think it's just in preparation for the book and of course, then printing the book. Uh, mm -hmm. Although, although interestingly with cold wind, cold, so many people's books were being moved because of the virus and they were being moved months. And it was, it was a little scary. You didn't know if your book was going to get moved or not. And then cold wind, I got a message. We're moving your book, but it was only a week. So the warehouse, or, you know, ran into some issues because of the virus in this crazy time, but they got it out, you know, a week later. So I think the printing is the last thing, the last minute, but um, I don't, yeah, I, that's a great question. I'm going to say sales and marketing. Okay. Yeah, they're all selling it to libraries. <laughs> I know we had an author who visited us a few months ago, and it was a very strange thing for her where her ebook came out, you know, when it was supposed to. Her print book wasn't going to come out for like six more months because of, of the pandemic. And it was just a very weird thing for her to be, you know, she liked to say, here's my book. but Here's my book, but it's not, oh boy, that is the first I've heard of that. But that makes sense though, because the ebook's done. But yeah. if the warehouse is backed up for printing or the, I get that. Oh, that had to be rough. Things, yeah. Yeah, that had to be rough. Uh, great question from Amber. Do you read novels while you're in the process of writing? 
I do. And I read, I read things that I'm not writing typically. Um, a lot of times I read, this is so weird. People always find this so weird. I read space books, like Martians and aliens and spaceships and stuff like that. It's just a wonderful escape for me. That's what I listen to on my audiobooks in my car. I like to read uh, some women's fiction. I like to read some just, you know, literary fiction. I really enjoy um, that as well. But uh, I really don't like to cry a lot. So if it if it's too heart wrenching, no thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great segue to our next question from Shauna in Utah. Hi, Shauna. Now she's a friend I know. Hi. <laughs> well, hello, my friend. Since you've moved from Cozy to Suspense, do you think you'll ever dip your toe in horror? Oh, oh, now see, she's the one who should write horror. Tell Shauna right now, Shauna, get on that horror. She actually got a letter from Stephen King many years ago. I know, I know. Cool. Um, well, I don't think I could do horror. I wish I could, Shauna. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wish I could. I know you love it. <laughs> definitely polar opposite of... Uh... Of, of cozy for sure. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So if anyone else wants to throw out some questions or raise your hand, we have, we have a little bit of time left. In my mind, I'm just thinking, I always think, you know, visually, I think Jessica Fletcher, ultimate yeah. cozy. Protagonist. That's definitely cozy. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm just definitely. Thinking, yeah. Picture, you know, Bloody crime spring in the. <laughs> I remember when I was in in college, um, I heard somebody talking about the murder she wrote TV series and some other people putting it down, and I was so offended. I'm like, how dare you put down Jessica Fletcher? I was just totally mortified and offended. We all must love Jessica Fletcher. <laughs> and she dominated TV for. 12 years. I mean, a very successful series, very successful and still writing books. In fact, yeah. um, one of my agents, I believe, I believe it's Jessica's authors, Terry Morin is, has been signed on now to write the Jessica Fletcher books. So keep reading them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say, I always, whenever I get my hands on an author, I always want to say, Hey, if you're looking for ideas, what about set in the library? <laughs> oh, there are some, uh, uh, Jen McKinley writes a great library series. So the library lover series. Yep. Oh, wonderful. They're wonderful. Yeah. Uh, another great question from Jerry. Are you able to work on more than one book at a time? I have to, isn't that crazy? I have to be working on two things at the same time because um, I actually heard an author describe it like this and I'm drawing a blank on who it was, but your creative well is filled to a certain point and then that particular creativity gets drained, but it's still over here. So I have to bounce back and forth between two things, it, even in the same day. It's, it's the way I've managed to have a couple different series running at the same time. It wasn't necessarily, it was, it was, all, it was necessary for me to have two different creative outlets uh, to let the other one fill back up. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. When you're kind of riding the high of success of one to the other, that's a, that's a great way to keep it going. It's fun. Um, okay. I, I don't see any more raised hands. Uh, someone asked a question about, reincarnation experience in the Scottish series. I don't think I've gotten that far. In that Scottish was in, okay, bear with me. That's in the stolen letter. I'm pretty sure the one that published last year and um, it's Mary Queen of Scots and a woman and Delaney run into each other literally and they kind of look alike. And the woman, um, the woman claims to be a reincarnation of Mary Queen of Scots. And so that's kind of part of the mystery. And if, if maybe your question is wondering where I got that from, my nephew once, when he was little, he would, and in the book, I also talk about this with another character. When my nephew was little, he could describe things on the Titanic. And and so, I mean, there was no reason for him to describe those things. He was little, he hadn't really had access to anything. And so it was, it was kind of bizarre and people were just assuming, well, maybe he's just reincarnated and had been on the Titanic. So it's always been fascinating for me. I, I don't necessarily feel like I've been reincarnated. If I have, I'm sure it was one of those people doing all the work <laughs> way back, way back when, but, um, but yeah, that was, that was from definitely was inspired by something my nephew had talked about. Okay. How often do you 
do you feel like you're do you feel like you're always just kind of on the prowl for inspiration or, or I guess it's a question that every author gets like where do the ideas come from and then how much do you have to mine that raw material right you know interestingly and and this is the difference my imagination is always on always going always going crazy like for instance that picture behind you of the asteroid i'm guessing mm -hmm. i mean my mind in the back of my mind has been yep that picture in the back of my mind i've been i've been having space stories and, and so my imagination is always going it is and i could look I could look at a dog walking down the street and, you know, look over at my husband and say some story about the person walking the dog. And it's just crazy. It's just the way my imagination is nonstop. Now, the thing that surprises me is that not everybody is like that. So <laughs> that's been the biggest shock over the last few years. It's like, really? You guys aren't seeing space stories and, and dog stories? So I just have a very busy imagination. I must have been fun during the pandemic just to to have that call oh picture this there's a dead body but only the oh. dog is a witness <laughs> oh yeah I, I would talk about stuff like all the time all the time yes oh yeah always come up with with mystery murder scenes oh yeah <laughs> well this is an interesting segue to another question from linda have you ever had writer's block and if so how did you resolve it you know, I haven't, I'm knocking on wood here because I haven't had writer's block yet. So you never know when it'll get here. I think a part of that is I might've had what some people call writer's block, but I just kept writing. It was garbage and I had to edit it out later, but I just kept writing and then finally found a flow again. So even if it's like, and she did this, that, 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 blah, 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 blah. If you just keep going, at least for me, it's gotten me on the other side of what probably is writer's block. And I just don't, I just don't have time to have it. Hmm. it yeah. Deadlines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll just do one last call for any other questions or if anyone wants to raise their hand to, to ask Paige a question. Let's see. Um, it's a question from Barbara. Do you, do you keep a journal or list of topics that'll be in future books? Like, do you know things that you don't know how you're going to use them, but like they're going to find a way at some point? Absolutely. 100%. I have a written journal and a file and files on my computer. Um, I journal everything. I journal how many pages I've done, what I'm working on, new characters, names. I journal all of that every day. Okay, cool. That, that's a great way to ensure there's definitely no writer's block. Just always be writing. Well, yeah, at least it gets the juices flowing. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, well, I don't see anything else. I just wanted to thank you again so much for, for sharing your time with us. and, and Thank you. Allowing us to kind of peel back the curtain and, and just talk about the process and, and the industry. Um, and I hope everyone will go check out Paige's books. I can't speak about uh, how much fun The Crack Spine was enough. And I'm looking forward to starting the Alaska Mystery Series myself. Well, uh, thank especially you. if it gets warmer, it seems like a great... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for all you do. Librarians are priceless and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be civilized without you. So thank you. And thanks to everybody who tuned in and, and participated. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night, everybody. And, and stay safe out there.